Good morning, good morning. My name is Marco Johnson, the lead pastor here at Vibrant Church. Super pumped about this brand new series that we are starting called One Minute After You Die. And I want to take a moment, I want to welcome those watching online. Vibrant Church family, can we give those watching online a hand clap today? Thank you so much for being a part of Vibrant Church. We're glad that you are here with us. Um, There's questions about life after death. Is there a heaven? Am I good enough? That's a good question. Am I good enough for heaven? What if I'm not? What happens after I die? In this series, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what exactly happens going straight to the Bible one minute after you die. How many of you would say this? Marco, if I'm honest, I don't even like thinking about dying, let alone talking about dying. I mean, I, I think our hands, a lot of our hands could go up because that's the majority of people. It, it can be kind of a scary topic to think about. It can be a, a depressing topic to think about. It could be something that, man, I just, I don't want to go there because, man, that could be a sad, sad time. But the reality is, is we will spend eternity somewhere We will pass from this earth. We will die, and we will spend eternity somewhere. Because the truth is this. Yeah, I may not want to talk about dying, but the reality is we don't actually die. We go on and live eternally somewhere. So we're going to start in 2 Corinthians. And what I want to do is I want to do something a little bit different today for the reading of God's Word. We've got a pretty big passage of Scripture to read. For the reading of God's Word, I'd like for us all to stand and just honor God's Word today as we read this section of Scripture. So stand with us, please. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. It says this. It says, for we know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, We will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to be put in our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies one day. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. Anybody can relate to that? We groan and we sigh and we toil. But it's not that we want to die or get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. That's called faith. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then then we will be home with the Lord. So whether we are here, and don't miss this this last section here, so whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please Him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. You may be seated. So what is the goal as we read this passage of Scripture? What is the goal? Why do we exist? What is our assignment in these earthly bodies? We see in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, it says, So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to what? Please Him. It's to please God. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each, each one of us in this room, all of us, all of us that are on this planet, we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Our goal in life is not to make a lot of money. Nothing wrong with making money. Money is amoral. It's neither evil nor good. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is not the root of all evil, but it's the root of all kinds of evil. The love of it, the spirit of mammon. But money is amoral. There's nothing wrong with it. Our goal in life is not to become YouTube famous. (laughs) It's not to get thousands of likes on social media. It's not to have the Pinterest perfect family. Our goal, if you can pull that slide up, our goal in life 
is to please God. Amen. Our goal in life is to please God. Marco, why would we take a topic like death and talk about it? I mean, Marco, the last time I checked, it's not an extremely fun subject to talk about. The reason that we're going to talk about one minute after you die is because, if you can pull up the next slide, what you believe about eternity determines how you live today. What you believe about what happens after you die determines actually how you live your life today. If you believe that you're an accident where there's no God, there's, there's no eternity, then you will live a selfish life driven by the pleasures of the moment. And you will see the destructive power of living for now. But instead, if you believe that you were created by an almighty, all-powerful God for His glory, and that you will live somewhere eternally, it will shape differently how you live. What you believe about eternity will determine how you live today. See, you will live eternally somewhere. And if there's anything that I could equip you with, Vibrant Church, it's that understanding that, man, we are, we are only here. We're going to talk about this a little bit more a little bit later in the message. But we are only here for a speck of time compared to all of eternity. What I mean, let's just say we live 120 years. That would be a pretty long life. You'd be like, boy, that's a, that's a long time, 120 years. But compared to trillions and trillions times the trillions and trillions and trillions of years of eternity, it's only a tiny little speck that you couldn't even see, probably even with the Hubble telescope. Because eternity is forever, and we will all live eternally somewhere. Your physical body will cease to exist at some point, and your soul will continue to live. So today I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about three things that happens immediately after this life is done. There's going to be three things. There's more, but today I'm going to talk about three things that the moment you take your last breath, they happen. And here's the first one. We briefly discussed this already, but it's number one. The first thing that happens is our physical bodies die. Our physical bodies that you see right now, they die. I don't know if you knew this or not, but just pay attention, by the way, to, to research. Pay attention to science, because what you're going to find out is, is as science, quote unquote, progresses, it actually, they start proving the Bible true. And they're like, well, you know, we found out that the Bible is actually accurate in this area. And us as followers of Jesus are like, yeah, you know, we, we kind of knew that already, you know. But man, research shows uh, this, this incredible uh, uh, research came out and they, they, were go, they said again, man, we found out that this part of the Bible is actually true as well. And that part of the Bible that they found out was true was one in one person actually die. I don't know if you knew that or not, you know, but that was supposed to be funny. That didn't go out. That didn't happen. I got planned. As I'm actually telling a joke, I'm like, this isn't going to be funny. You know? I don't know why I put this in here. <laughs> <laughs> but studies show one in one people actually die. And, and here's what's interesting is you were created from the dust and you will actually return to the dust. So let's take a look at scripture and, and just see what the Bible says about this concept. Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, it says, just as people are destined to die once, and that once is key, when you die, you don't get reincarnated and come back to life twice as like a monkey or a plant or something like that. That does not happen. You die once and then you spend eternity somewhere. And the Bible says, and after that, to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So what is the first thing that immediately happens when this life is done? Our physical bodies die. The second thing that happens is when this life is immediately done is this. Number two, our souls separate from our physical bodies. 
So in that moment, our body passes. Our soul continues to live. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 28. By the way, in this, this entire series, we're just going to let the Bible speak for itself. We're going to go and we're going to look at a lot of Scripture. Matthew 10, 28, it says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, don't fear people, but live in a reverence for God. See, when your body ceases to exist, your soul will continue to live. In other words, at your funeral one day, after the service is over and everyone gathers at Aunt Karen's house and they're eating a potluck dinner, you will never be more alive in that moment when all your family and friends are gathered around the table. You will never be more alive than in that moment. And in that moment, you will face either an eternity in heaven or you will face either an eternity in hell. But you will be alive. Je Jesus illustrated this truth in John's gospel when he encountered Martha, who was upset about Lazarus, her brother, uh, that had died. And Lazarus had been dead for four days. And, and I love what the King James Version says. The, the King James Version says in the Bible, it says that Lazarus' body stinketh. I mean, that's how long that he'd been laying there. It, it, he'd been dead for a while. And man, Martha was upset. And we see what it says in John 11, 25 through 26. It says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, will live. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, what happens to your soul of a believer after the body dies, what happens? We don't know all the details, but what we do know is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We do know that there were two criminals on the cross next to Jesus the day that he was crucified. And both of these criminals were guilty. One recognized that they needed forgiveness, the other didn't. And the one that recognized that they needed forgiveness cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, please forgive me. And look what Jesus says in Luke 23, 42 through 43. Then he said, the criminal, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Where's paradise at? We don't know. But we do know that it is a whole lot better than being here on this earth. Paul actually understood the concept of eternity, and he understood the, the goodness of heaven, and, and he actually even wrestled with the idea of life or death. Um, if you don't know much about the Apostle Paul, an incredible church planner, uh, planted church all over Asia, you're all over the place, and uh, he wrote, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and the thing about the Apostle Paul is you would think that, man, a guy like the Apostle Paul, man, he would just, God would be like hooking him up left and right. You know where Paul spent the majority of his time? In prison. You know, it's like, well, God, aren't you like a good God? You know, things aren't working out the way that I thought they were. If Paul wouldn't have been in prison, he wouldn't have penned probably two-thirds of the New Testament like he did. God knows what he's doing. I don't know what your circumstances look like in life. I don't know if you're, you just feel stuck. I don't know if you feel uh, defeated. I don't know if you feel just kind of chained up like, God, what's up? You know, I don't know what's going on. But God's going to take and can use anything that's going on in your life and work it for his glory and his good, just like he did for the Apostle Paul. And if there was anyone that deserved to be set free from prison, if there was anyone that deserved just the, to get hooked up in life, it was the Apostle Paul. But God used that. And look where Paul, the Apostle Paul was. He was probably tired of being locked up. He was probably tired of being chained to a Roman guard. He's like, the cool thing about being chained to a Roman guard, though, was he had like a captive audience for eight hours, you know? It was like, all right, you're the next one. You're about to hear all about Jesus. You ready? You know? 
But there probably came a point where he was sick and tired of the food. He was sick and tired of the cold. And he just started contemplating, man, everything inside of me, I just want to go and be with the Lord. Like the next Roman guard that walks in here, just take me out. You know, like I, I just, I want to go and be with my Father in heaven. But then there was also a part of the Apostle Paul was like, well, if I do go and die now and go to heaven, then the people that I need to reach, the people that I need to share the message of Jesus Christ with, man, I'm not going to be able to reach them. So we find that the Apostle Paul was torn between going and spending eternity in heaven or actually continuing with his life. And we see this in Philippians 1, 20 through 4, 24, it says, Man, I eagerly expect, this is the Apostle Paul talking, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ, meaning the gospel of Christ can go forward, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? What shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. What happens one minute after we die? We know that our physical bodies die while our soul continues to live. And then at some point, We get to number three. Don't miss this. This is important. Number three is this. We will all face judgment. We will all face judgment. Peter said it this way. 1 Peter 1.17 And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. Vibrant Church, man, if I can equip you with anything as your pastor, I want you to know that you will be rewarded. The the things that you do out in our community, the things that you do uh, for building our church and building God's church and reaching people for Jesus, you will be rewarded for it. I mean, I can remember being in Bible school and And I was so just determined to live for God because my life was a mess before. And the the forgiveness that I received for the sins that I had committed. And and now that I had purpose in my life, I can remember, um, some of y'all have heard this story, but uh, a lot of my friends during Bible school, my first year of Bible school, they got to all go out and do what was called sidewalk Sunday school. Maybe some of you have heard it or not. But for us in Bible school, it was an opportunity to preach. You know, and if you're like, you know, you're getting trained up as a pastor, like what you want to do is you want to preach, you know, and it's like, man, put me up there, coach, you know, like put me in the game. Come on, I'm ready, you know, and, uh, and I can remember, you know, my friends going out and them being able to go and preach at Sidewalk Sunday School and kind of going into the, the rough areas of town. And I mean, I love doing that type of stuff and sharing the message of Jesus. They all got to go do that. But you know what my job was? Hey, Marco, we need you to stay back and clean up. In fact, we need you to take care of the restrooms. And my job the entire first year of Bible school was to clean the bathrooms. And I can remember thinking to myself, sitting there with Ajax and a scrub brush, on my knees cleaning toilets, and I remember thinking, God, if you want me to clean toilets for the rest of my life, I'll do it for your glory. I'll do it for you. And I remember God speaking to me one day, and he just said, Marco, if I can trust you with being a servant then I can trust you with my word. If I can trust you with the small things, then I can trust you with the big things. And I just want you to know this. God sees the small things that you do. He sees you and and he's watching you. And he, he sees that person that you love on. That person that you go and you encourage. He sees us and we will be rewarded according to the things that we do on this planet. And we will all face judgment for these things. See, we must remember that the world is not our home. You're just passing through. You're just passing through. Just a short period of time and a long-term plan of things. See, we also have another guarantee. 
And that guarantee is we will all be judged according to how we live. And today I want to I want to kind of go a little bit kind of deeper theologically and give you a little understanding of what these judgments are going to look like. You're going to face two judgments and the first one is called this. The great white throne judgment. Again, we're going to go straight to scripture. We're going to see this right in scripture. It says in Revelation 20:11 through 12 and 15 it says And I saw a great white throne, hence the great white judgment, and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. There will be no place to hide when we face our Father in heaven. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. Say the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So what is the book of life? What is it? What we know is Jesus was born the Son of God. He lived a sinless life. Jesus made no errors in his lifetime. That is important to understand about our our spotless, the perfect spotless sacrifice that gave his life for us. He made no errors. He was perfect. And then he sacrificed his life on a cross so that our sins could be washed by his blood and we could be forgiven. How many of you are grateful for God's forgiveness? The moment we say yes to surrendering our life to Jesus, our name, here's some good news. The moment we surrender to Jesus, we're all in, God. I give my life to Jesus Christ. Our name gets written down in the book of life. All of a sudden, you a VIP, baby. That's all I got to say. All of a sudden, you go into the who's who of eternity. However, we also have to realize this fact. If when you die and God looks through the book of life and your name is not there, the next place you go is a place you're not going to want to go. It is a true, actual place, a lake of fire called hell. And you will be there forever. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and if there's a passage of scripture that scares the fire out of me, no pun intended, every time I read it, it's this one. It says Matthew 21 through 23, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I mean, here you have people prophesying. Here you have people being extremely charismatic. Here you have people driving out demons. Here you have people doing miracles in the name of Jesus. And check out what this next sentence says. Then I will tell them plainly, like there will be no stuttering. I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. How many of y'all just went? (laughs) Strong verse, but it's the Bible. In our world, it might be, man, I went to church every now and then. I went to church in your name. Man, I even slipped a little bit of money in the offering box every once in a while. I I was nice to people. I I volunteered in the community. I volunteered in the church. I, I even bought some shoes that helped another person get shoes in a third world country. Jesus is going to go, great, but you didn't do my will. Away from me, I never knew you. You never did my will. All of a sudden, a lot of us in this room go, yo, Marco, what's God's will? (laughs) (laughs) 
That's why as your pastor, I encourage you constantly to know God's Word, to learn God's Word, to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, because to know God's Word is to know God's will. When you're reading Scripture and you're memorizing Scripture and you're getting the Word of God in you, there will be circumstances that you will be put in in life. And the cool thing about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, is the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance all things that are learned. That's why if you don't study for a test and you're like, God, help me out, and He doesn't help you out, it's because He's not going to. (laughs) He's only going to bring back. you got to (laughs) study. And then he will bring back those things that you learned. And that's why we'll be put in situations. You've got to know the word of God. Because you'll be put, what is the will in this moment? And then you will be quickened by the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is what God's word says that I need to do. But then there's also God's unrevealed will. Who do I marry? What school do I go to? What college do I attend? What job do I take? If God can't trust us with his revealed will... What makes us think that he's going to trust us with his unrevealed will? We've got to know God's word. We've got to learn God's word. We've got to study because as we study his word, we begin to learn who he is. Church, I want you to know this. You serve a loving God. You serve a kind God. And it is his kindness that draws us to repentance. But you also serve a God that disciplines those that he loves. You also serve a God that is justice-driven. He is both love and justice. He sits on a mercy seat, but he is a judge. And he will judge us according to the way that we lived our life. And my question for you, church, today is, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing on the way that you're living your life? The Bible says, depart from me, for I never knew you. And that phrase, I never knew you, could be broken down into a Greek phrase that actually means this. The intimacy between a husband and a wife. It's not a sexual intimacy, but how many of you know, when you get married and you walk through marriage, all of a sudden you start, you know, like, somebody will tell you something and you can be like, you know, I know my wife ain't going to go for that. You know, because you just know, you, you're intimate. You know each other. You know each other very close. And that is the same intimacy that God is looking in our relationship with him. It's not just, hey, I'm going to go to church every once in a while. It's not like, hey, I'm just talking to the man upstairs. You know, it's not like, hey, God, you know, up there, just kind of help me out. It's, good morning, Father. How you doing today? I know you're doing good, but I need some help. Can you help me? I love you. And you get in your truck, you get in your car, you're going to work. God, you know what's going on at work. You know, you know what's going on at work. I need your help. And you go to work and you're talking with God throughout the day. You're living for God throughout the day. Then you go home. God, I'm exhausted. I need a nap. But I know I got kids at home that need a parent. I know my spouse needs me. God, I need your help. Please help me. God, I worship you. God, I love you. God, I praise you. I lift up my hands as my strength because ultimately I know that I'm weak, but in my weakness through you, I am strong. God, I want to know you. What are you like? What are you like? What would you do in this situation, God? Oh, that's what you would do because that's what your word says. Jesus is going to go, stay with me because I knew you. Well done, good and faithful servant. See, there's going to be two judgments, the great white throne judgment, and then there's the second one, the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, for we must all appear before the, say it with me, judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Marco, what is the judgment seat of Christ? It comes from the Greek word bema. And the word bema is taken actually from the Greek Olympics. And so what was it? What was bema? 
after a race, check this out, the winners would come before the judge who would stand on the bema. And then they would proceed to give out their rewards according to the place of the athlete. The bema was not a seat to, to judge, hey, did you qualify? The bema seat was there to celebrate that you finished. Here's your reward. The bema is not a place where your sins are judged. Your sins were judged and forgiven by Jesus. This is a place, check this out, where Jesus acknowledges what you did on earth. And it's rewarded in heaven. What does this mean? For our parking crew out in the parking lot waving in those cars out in 100 degree heat. You're going to get a reward. For those people in our church that stay after to clean and scrub toilets and sweep and vacuum, you're going to get a reward. For those in your workplace that receive ridicule for being a Christian, but you still stood up for the cause of Christ, you never wavered in your faith, you're going to get a reward. For those times as you're there parenting and you don't know what to do as a parent, but the only thing that you can do is hold on to the Bible because it's the most solid thing that you've ever seen in your life. So you decide to obey God's word and listen to conventional wisdom. You're going to be rewarded. For those times in secret, when you did what was right, though you were tempted like crazy to do something wrong, you're going to receive a reward. God is going to look at you on his Bema, Jesus on the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, and go, hey, here's your reward. Here's your reward. What does this mean? It means this. We are saved by grace, but we're rewarded by works. We're saved by grace. There's nothing you can do, no amount of good deeds. Well, if I... If I just do a little bit more good than I do bad, then the balance and the scales is going to shift over to the good. Then because I did good, I'm going to get into heaven. That's not how it works. As we've seen over these last couple of weeks, our righteousness, our good deeds are actually, the Bible says, filthy rags in the eyes of a perfect God. That is why we need the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And church family, I want you to know, the grace and the mercy of God through Jesus Christ is available to you. We receive salvation through grace, but we are rewarded according to our works. What happens one minute after we die? Our physical bodies are gone. Our soul separates from our physical bodies, and then we will face judgment. A question for you today is, whether you're here, whether you're watching online, are you ready for judgment? When Jesus looks at you, is he going to be able to say, I knew you. And not only did I know you, but man, you kept me on my toes. Well done, good and faithful servant.